Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of Five Minutes in GI, a show that we have designed to try and answer the most frequently asked questions about gastrointestinal disorders in just under five minutes. I am your host, Alyssa Sutton, and I am the program coordinator for the International Foundation for Gastrointestinal Disorders, otherwise known as IFFTD. Today, I am so honored to welcome our very first guest, Dr. Sam Dilmagani, who is a fellow at the Mayo Clinic as well as IFFTD's junior academicians. He has a background in epidemiology as well as biostatistics, and his research interests focus on functional GI disorders like irritable bowel syndrome, as well as motility disorders like gastroparesis. Dr. Dilmagani, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's my honor to be contributing to this. Absolutely. So today's first question is, what common GI disorders are associated with the disruption of GI motility? So that's a great question. So disruptions in gastrointestinal motility, which we generally refer to as dysmotility, are extremely common and are associated with many other gastrointestinal disorders. It's important to recognize that the entire GI tract from the mouth to the anal canal relies on coordinated neuromuscular functioning to digest and propel food, waste, acid, and bacteria throughout the tract, which is referred to as the GI lumen. For example, Dysmotility can cause some of the most common GI conditions like constipation and diarrhea. So more specifically, dysmotility can lead to poor movement of stool throughout the large intestine, which we call the colon, which results in the stool being stuck in one area, which then will dry out and become very hard. We generally call this slow transit constipation. If this is diagnosed, your GI provider may prescribe you a medication to help those muscles of the GI wall propel the stool forward so it doesn't get so hard. Another uh, uh, disorder that is associated with dysmotility is pelvic floor dyssynergia, which is also sometimes referred to as dyssynergic defecation or more broadly, pelvic floor dysfunction. In this case, the muscles of the pelvic floor and anal canal become discoordinated So they have a difficult time expelling the stool from the rectum. This stool can also be retained and then also will become too hard, which causes the symptoms of constipation. Very importantly, this is treated differently than slow transit constipation I mentioned before, and it's best treated by an expert physical therapist that's familiar with this condition. The GI motility disorders that lead to diarrhea are unsurprisingly the opposite. So instead of the colon muscles um, being very slow, they're actually hyperactive, similar to how you may get a muscle spasm in any other muscle. These hyperactive muscles can be due to chemicals that are in the GI tract that irritate the muscles like bile acids. They could be due to medications that you're taking, but in many cases, we actually haven't figured out exactly why those muscles are hyperactive. When the condition is very severe, and when the muscles of that pelvic floor are a little weak, you can have episodes of incontinence or accidents with bowel movements. In some cases, some patients have abdominal pain that is associated with their constipation or diarrhea. And in that case, your provider may diagnose you with irritable bowel syndrome, which is another condition that is associated with gastrointestinal motility disorders, although there are other causes of irritable bowel syndrome as well. Another very common condition that we see in gastroenterology is heartburn, which is also known as gastroesophageal reflux disease, or we sometimes just say GERD. Importantly, you should recognize that there's a barrier muscle, also called a sphincter, that separates the esophagus, which is the swallowing pipe at the top, and the stomach at the bottom. So one category of causes for GERD are deficiencies in that sphincter muscle. Those deficiencies can be temporary or even permanent and involve that muscle being too relaxed. And as you can imagine, when that barrier is too relaxed, what happens is the contents from the stomach can inappropriately reflux or travel up into the esophagus, which causes the typical symptoms of GERD, which will be things like heartburn, chest pain, or acid taste in the mouth, particularly after meals or when you're lying down to go to bed. There are a couple other GI disorders, although they're less common, that are noteworthy and are part of the whole GI dysmotility space. These include gastroparesis and achalasia. 
Gastroparesis is a condition that's defined by a delay in the emptying of food from the stomach that's due to a discoordination or sometimes even absent contraction of the muscles of the stomach. The symptoms of this condition can include feeling after you eat, for example, full very early. You can have a lot of bloating after you eat. And in some cases after you eat, you may experience nausea and vomiting. Achalasia is a diagnosis that means that sphincter barrier muscle between the esophagus and the stomach is hyperactive as opposed to being too relaxed, like we see in GERD. In achalasia, when that muscle is too contracted and too hyperactive, it makes passing the food from the esophagus to the stomach more challenging. The symptoms of this condition include gradual, having a gradual difficulty in swallowing your food, having the sensation that your food is getting stuck in your throat or your chest, along, some, along with regurgitation sometimes. Um, and these symptoms can be very similar to or mimic uh, your GERD symptoms. So if you have them, it's important to have your gastrointestinal specialist um, evaluate you for that. Thank you so much for sharing the most common GI disorders that are associated with the GI motility disruption. I think that definitely gives us a better understanding. And I also really do appreciate you mentioning the ones that are not as common, like gastroparesis and achalasia. If you are a patient that is watching this video and you had a question based off of anything that Dr. Dilmagani has said, please feel free to leave a comment in the box below and we will do our best to try to answer that question.